Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. On this week's episode, milk quality specialist Don Crowley reflects on SCC levels nationally following a turbulent February where poor weather conditions mean cows have spent more time housed. I suppose the anecdotal feedback Emma Louise, that they would be slightly higher than other years. The spring is always a challenging time anyway, but as we get more compact in calving, as we see in the national herd, and the figures are backing that up, we're putting more pressure, I suppose, on the facilities that we have. And then when we don't have to get out of jail clause of getting out to grass, let's say at least, you know, once a day, you know, it's putting massive pressure. And, and the anecdotal feedback would be good, it would be just definitely there has been a higher incidence in my opinion of, of cases of mastitis in ca- heifers in heifers calving down cows have started bullying now in sheds as well and that's causing an issue um as well look the, the three issues i'm seeing is farmers have started high and they've improved significantly then over a number of collections and that's primarily a block of heifers have calved down they were synchronized there was a few high and they sorted themselves out over next collections and and those and those herds in general are, are very high, are high we have a number of herds then that have started high and these would have been good and are good herds high but staying high and these really need to prioritize the milk recording as fast as possible what i get the farmers to do is go after last year's last recording and cmt test the problem cows from last year that have tested that have calved now and paddle test them or else get a sample down to go up to see what are they like now. They are more than likely the culprits of this, this year. It's probably a staph aureus infection carried off to this year. So I would dip clusters across the board just until I get a milk recording in those type of herds and get a sample, old tank sample, a couple of high cell count ones, and just get to know for those ones that are staying high, the three, four hundreds, that kind. Then we have the third one then that are coming back is these herds that traditionally quite good. We're getting a high case of these uh, clinical mastitis, cows getting sick, a strip mastitis, you had few colis. And really what's working in that scenario, it's an environmental type bug, disinfected lime in the cubicles for a week. Get rid of, not stop the other limes, just disinfectant morning and evening for a week and go to liquid cream dips like your mastocyte, other galls, et cetera, there's rakeum. It's slow, there's a lot of work on it, but it works. The feedback is very positive. When you're talking to the farmer yesterday, and he's very happy with the way things ha- has corrected itself. Just to pick up on a few points there, Don, I guess straight to what you just mentioned there, um, you know, looking at a different lime product for a week. Can you give us more information on that? The, 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 the types of products that we're looking at is, and there's a lot of them on the market. You've the likes of the Stalis and F, you've Pratt's and X, you've Actisan, and there's loads of other products that are very good. So they, they are lime-based products, but they contain a disinfectant within them or a bacterial inhibitor inside them. They were used originally in farrowing houses and pigs to control E. coli scores. And we are using them a lot more now on, on, on cubicle bedding. And again, the anecdotal feedback is very positive. Like what we're trying to do is reduce the bacterial challenge that the cow is exposed to when they lie down. And we're not going to sterilize anything, but we're going to reduce the challenge. If you're going in with a liquid disinfectant, you're wetting everything. Whereas this at least you're having the drying impact of the lime, but you're having the disinfecting properties and reducing the challenge on it. And the, the, from the number of farmers I've been dealing with this just on the last couple of weeks, feedback is very positive on that. Traditionally, we'd have used it once a week. But if you hit trouble, go morning and evening for a week. It's amazing how it settles the whole thing down. Then also you mentioned where there are, um, you know, a big, strong group of heifers calving within a short space of time. It tends to elevate SCC. And that is, you know, high cell count in a heifer. An animal that's calving for the first time. Why are you seeing high cell count in those particular group of animals? I suppose traditionally before, I mean, they would have happened, but it got lost in the system because if there's one heifer within a group, she'd have got lost within the cows because they had a diluted her impact. You know, So traditionally, if you milk a car, that she could come in at one or two million and the next milk a car, she's coming in at 20, 30,000. It's usually stress induced. And if you paddle test those heifers, they'll be high in three or four quarters. So it's stress. She's stressed. She's into a new environment. She's probably getting a bit bullied. Immune system is on overdrive and she gets a high, but she sorts herself out. You know, so these are just a high, you know, they're, I, they're the ones and they sort themselves out. We're seeing this as an issue you now because I've so many heifers calving together. If I had 30, 40 heifers calved in a week, which is possible in some herds, five or six of them could be high. So they will impact on my tank initially. Whereas if they were spread over three or four weeks, I wouldn't have noticed it as much, you know, so... But the, the real issue is heifers calving with clinical mastitis. That's a big issue out there. 
and and we're losing quarters, losing heifers, you know, and that's a that's some cost in the system because they've never gone into the system to help any make any contribution to pay for themselves. They're gone, you know. And as you say, if it's a stress issue and that, you know, that occurs in all heifers, you know, calving down for the first time, that is reflected in the paddle test. Clinical cases in heifers, why is this occurring, Don? Look, the, the majority of it is housing. The majority is coming back to housing in the sense of they might have been Google, the lack of housing in, in, the, in the heifers. Look, the modern day heifer seems to be... Um, a little bit more can be a little bit more prone to it if their teats are very open they're leaking milk coming up to calving i think look teat spraying the heifers uh, pre pre calving um every day if you can for the two to three weeks prior to calving is a, a significant help and there's research backing that up some farmers are teat sealing the heifers before calving it's too late for doing that now you would want to be doing that last november december feedback is very positive that's not for everyone but it's coming back to the point no People that have enough uh, cubicles for their heifers are still running into issues. So we need to look at maybe the disinfectant line for our in-calf heifers coming coming in at that stage as well. But it's it's a huge cost in the system and it's becoming more prevalent. And I guess if we step outside of, you know, just looking at um, the bull tank SCC and cases of mastitis for a moment, Don, and, you know, reflect on the month of February, like extremely wet and challenging and, you know, not as we would have hoped uh, um, the month would have come in terms of getting out to grass, um, you know, taking the pressure off the the facilities and the people operating on farms like from your experience talking to farmers, you know, what is the impact on the overall system? Uh, you know, things are positive. We're heading into a week of good forecast. But, but um, you know, where are things at on farm at the moment? Well, it's a funny, really tough. It's just tough going outside at the moment. The workload is something crazy. And fellas are really at their wits in now, like, you know. And, and you know, when people reflect on this afterwards, like, with climate change and it's in the system at the moment and the way the weather can throw at us, we have really got to look at our winter housing system from the side of view of slurry capacity and cubicle housing. They are a significant capital cost on the business, but the, the, for man and beast, mentally, physically, financially, they have got to be tackled. Like worrying about slurry and trying to get rid of slurry now and you have so much else in your head we've got to deal with slurry capacity and and cubicles like if something goes wrong i have nowhere to put you know segregating these animals to mitigate against spread to other herds whether it be whatever disease issue a vet is dealing with our your advisors you know to have those ability to segregate it it just beds down the whole thing it's when you your good facilities come stand the test when you hit a, what we've hit in the last two to three weeks you know, no, we're coming into a very good week, please God, and that'll lift. But it could break again, you know, you just, it really, facilities really come into their own. Looking then to the particular types of mastitis that are being picked up on farms at the moment, like what is common for February, March? The the ones we're seeing, strep uberus is the main one, right? We're seeing, mainly seeing strep uberus. E. coli, we'll see very little E. coli because most fellas are using sealer and we'll see a little bit of it, but not huge. It's, it, the vets will be dealing with it, but not a huge, it's more a summertime issue, I'd say. Staph aureus, we're seeing a little bit of staph aureus. These are the high cell counts, no, cla- no mastitis, but high cell counts. And they're remnants since lack lactation. So they're chronic cows that should have been culled. that are back into the system now again this year. You will see a little bit of strep dyscalactia which is a ropey type of clad. It blocks the opening of the teeth. It's an environmental type bug and, and generally quite easy to cure. But you can see that I've mentioned four different bugs, the main one being strep uberus. So you need to know your enemy. You have to take samples early before you treat them, freeze them, cow number, and get them into the lab to know what you're dealing with. The majority of them will be strep uberus at this time of the year. Staff will build in more, but there is a little bit of staff as fellas are expanding, they're hauling onto cows that should expand, and you've staff carrying over into this year. Usually they break down four to six weeks after calving. So you have fellas that have calved the end of January. There could be a couple of those cows now starting to break down with cell count. No, let's say the last week of February, first week of March. You know, they, you think they're very good, and now they start breaking down. So people might see cell count starting to elevate now as they're going on. The other thing too is cows are starting to bull a little bit too inside in, in sheds and stuff as well. But um, they're the main four. They're the main four. And looking then to, say, strep uberus, the, the most common type we're seeing, what is the, I guess, treatment? Um, like, can you give us an example treatment for um, that particular strain of mastitis? 
again, look, you know, for farmers, it's very hard to know. You know, you need an injectable antibiotic. You know, you need to talk to your vet about getting an injectable antibiotic because cows can get quite sick with it, you know, and their immune system is down after calving, especially so close to calving. So intervening with an injectable antibiotic, um, a broad spectrum tube, your synaloxis, terexines, whatever you find working well in, in, on your health. And as well as that, I find, especially with strep oops, any type of mastitis is, is an anti-inflammatory with it as well. Um, mastitis is an inflammatory response. It's a pain. You know, I hurt myself, I hurt my shoulder, I hurt my leg, and I get swollen. There's an inflammatory response to that. So it is quite painful. So the anti-inflammatories control the inflammation and they'll help the antibiotic to penetrate the infection better. You need to talk to your vet about these anti-inflammatories because, you know, they're extremely good, but you can't overuse them either. But they're, they should be in your armory. Like, you know, these non-steroidal painkillers, you know, and, and you need to talk to your vet about that. But, uh, you know, for strep ubris, the penicillin-based injections are quite good on it. You have mamazin, you have um, synalax. There's a number of them, and you need to talk to your vet on, on those. But, you know, once you have strep ubris, you can go in with specific treatments then. And just, again, to pick up on some points there um, that you mentioned, Don. So, like, in terms of, you know, you've named out, uh, you know, various options in terms of what people can use. Uh, you know, you, you've mentioned some of the common tubes. Um, you mentioned you can't overuse them. But I guess how important is the VETS guidelines, say, in terms of the prescription uh, of length of treatment? Like, how important is it to follow that to the letter? Yeah, it is very important, Emily. It's like, it's like, look, you go to the doctor, they give you antibiotics, they say, follow the course. And you should, you know, and it's the same with the cow. If, if we don't follow the full course of treatment, especially the first time they get a clinical mastitis, what will happen is they come back as in two to three weeks' time as a reoccurring case. And they can develop into a chronic case very fast, where you'll get a clot in the first pull and then the milk is fine. And it, it takes ages for that to key. And she can develop into a chronic case then. So following the full, like if it's one tube a day for 24 hours, every 24 hours for three treatments, inject her every day for three to five days, whatever the vet suggests, follow it through. Even though there's a clinical, a visible clinical cure after 24, 36 hours, you could say a dramatic improvement in a cow the following milking or the milking after. I say, crikey, this is a great job. I'm finished. It's not. You have to keep going the treatment because what that will do is it'll mitigate against her coming back in two to three weeks' time. So when I treat her, that's it. It's finished. And there's fierce peace of mind in that then, you know, knowing that they won't come back and, and following through the course of treatment. And as well as that, you're going to mitigate against antibiotic resistance coming into your herd by following out the treatment. You, you've you mentioned this before, um, the pain, like, you know, the, the animal is in pain if they have a case of mastitis. Um, you know, is that un- underemphasized or do do we understand that enough, Don, in terms of the fact that we, 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 you know, we don't necessarily use it all the time and and include the, you know, the painkiller as part of a mastitis treatment? I think we do as, as, as farmers, because what we're seeing is we're, we're expecting this big swollen quarter affecting the way she walks slightly off farm. I then think to myself, I need something then to intervene then. But mastitis, every case of mastitis is an inflammatory response. So the, the control and inflammation is very important. And just from talking to veterinary practic- practitioners, they are they're really, you know, you know, promoting this as pain from an animal welfare point of view and pain management. And they say just the response to antibiotics. A number of vets have mentioned to me that look it is very important and it does, it is, you know, they, they use it in milk fever cases, they use it in lameness cases, you know, from a welfare point of view, but on mastitis, controlling the pain, controlling the inflammation, controlling the toxemia, it's giving the cow's own immune system then to a better chance to, and giving the antibiotics a better chance. So I, I think as farmers, just not to underestimate it, it's, try them, try them and, and talk to your vet on them. You will see a dramatic improvement. In terms then, Don, another issue um, that has come to light over the last number of uh, weeks, I I guess, heading into calving was the availability of uh, various mastitis tubes. Um, Where are we at in the country in terms of a stock and availability of the standard uh, tubes we would use to treat mastitis? Um, It is tight. It is tight, Emily. At at the moment... I think there's about 14 or 15 mastitis tubes that have a license, uh, you know, they're on the um, HIPAA website. Um, 
one or two of their licenses have been revoked, but actually available on the market at the moment, if you're going, going into your vet or your chemist to buy them or your co-op, there's probably about four or five available at the moment, um, likely to come back in the next May, June, July. But um, manufact- there's manufacturing issues, there's licensing issues, there's, you know, the, the availability of these mastitis tubes is becoming more um, a trickier thing there. You know, I suppose we can't take them for granted that they are going to be available. You know, I need tubes tomorrow morning. No. And I just happen to the car and talk to my vet and get my tubes or the co-op. It, it's not as simple as that. Like you need to make sure, number one, that you have the, your, you know, the one that you're working right from my culture and sensitivity. And number two, just make sure their availability. So making contact with your supplier is their availability is, is, is mixed at the moment. Likely to get better, but I'll believe that now when I see it. Yeah, it's I guess it's something that just to be to be very aware of. Um, so Don, you know, generally people are targeting, you know, a service of the machine and changing liners, those kind of jobs in the winter time. If this is something that people have let slip in the winter of 2020, you know, is this something that needs to be addressed? Yeah, it is something that's left slip, Emily. It's probably no different to any other year, but I suppose a lot of technicians have been doing a lot of fitting of new parlors this over the last six weeks, you know, prior. So they haven't probably been available for servicing. So look, I'd be booking my service straight away if there's any delay in the service that he can't come to. The biggest priority is getting a new set of liners on the, on the, on the, in the parlor. So if the cows are out and the pressure was off a little bit over next week, if you haven't it done already, get onto your technician and pick up a set of the liners and put them on yourself if you want to or else get on as a technician come in and do it fair but that's the one thing i would do is 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 just get a quick quick set of liners in and get your and prioritize getting the parlor tested as fast as you can because if there is a pre- issue with pulsation or vacuum or something it will it will do significant damage to cows like going forward now so you know if you can intervene early you're going to get good milk out with new liners that means there's less residual milk left inside the other and the whole thing starts coming into place. Looking then uh, at something you mentioned earlier, and it's something that we discuss, you know, every year on the podcast, but it's um, the uh, the practice of milk recording on farms. What level of dairy farms across the country are currently milk recording done? If you look at the national herd, I think we're, we're approximately about, we're over 40% of the dairy farmers in the country are milk recording. Wrong, give or take, wrong that. Now, it is representing close to around 50% of the cows in the country because, in general, it's the bigger herds. So, with, with the, and we've had, I know we've gone past our drying off, but with selective drying off coming down the tracks uh, in January 28th, January 2022, my God, it, it, it's, it's someone we're going to have to tackle this year, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a major issue. And t- talk through the cost on, like what they say. Um, I know now some farmers will record once a month. Some will record six times per year. And at the, I suppose, less frequent end, it's it's four times per year. What is the cost of completing milk recording um, on a dairy farm? Okay, so we have two, we have two systems. So if I'm going milk recording in the morning, I have two options. I can go manual, where someone comes in and helps me do the milk recording, takes the samples, writes down the data. And then you have E-D-E-I-Y, electronic DIY. So in the manual system, it starts off at four tests in a year, and that's costing €12.50 Euro per cow. A five test one is €14.25 per cow. A six test per year is €16 Euro per cow. A seven is €17.75 per cow. 10 is 22, 25 per cow. And the, the extreme then is one a month is 25, 25 per cow. And that's manual where someone is coming into your herd doing that. In, in an EDIY, let's say I've helped at home in the COVID type of scenario, I'm not too anxious about someone coming into my parlor at the present and I've, just, I've lads around at home. You have the electronic DIY where the, the lads will drop, uh, Munster or Progressive will drop the meters into your herd, set them up. So for a hundred cow herd, a four test a year will cost you 10.92 per cow. A five test per cow will cost you 13.65 per cow. And a six test will cost you 16.38 per cow. For all of them, there is an eight and a 10 available, but very few are doing that. So, and then there's a 65 euro annual herd fee included on top of that charges. So look, you take a hundred, you take a hundred cow herd at 10.92, that's gonna cost you 1100 euros to test, uh, to test your hundred cows four times a year. Plus 11.65, say, if you take the 65 test on top of it. 
like we, we I, in the annual report, I've been going through it with a couple of fellas, the gap between the best cow and the worst cow can be 12, 13, 1400 cows. And that's only between one, two cows. And that's my milk car I paid for. Because they'll give you at the end of the year, if I put in my dry off dates accurately, they'll give you your top 10 cows and your bottom 10 cows across the lactations. So from a cost point of view, it's an absolute no-brainer. We would have um, spoken previously to Stuart Childs and he would have also, you know, referred to the return on the investment of completing milk recording. And, you know, you, you've just identified one difference, the top and the bottom cow, the difference between them in terms of profit can pay for milk recording. But, you know, um, you know, Stuart quantified it in terms of additional milk produced. I, you know, there's also, you know, bigger effects on the herd in terms of selecting your very best cows to breed your replacement stock from. And, you know, identifying those chronic cases of mastitis that you talked about uh, previously, that you're not breeding replacements from them. And also that, you know, you're selecting them and removing them from the herd because, you know, they're, they've potential to do damage to other animals within the herd. I agree. Everything you said, I'm bang on. Bang on. And, and I think the biggest thing for the lads that are doing it and not doing it is the complete lack of engagement with the milk recording from the point of view of what it can actually give you to your business, as you've outlined there. And so for the people that are not milk recording, that are, will, to be fair, will have to do it this year. If they want to they have no choice, they're not going to get anything automatic in 2022 if they don't know what data they're dealing with. So like these people, you know, if there's someone looking at start the milk, so the people that have milk recorders, you know, that are milk recording, get your first milk recording done within 60 days of the first co-calving. So I know how my milk recording is done. For the people that haven't milk recorded, that never milk recorded before, get milk recording now at the end of March, but get on to Munster afterwards and, and your advisor or your vet and get them to explain the reports to you. When you get someone to explain your figures about your herd, it really rings home what this thing can do for me. And and it's grand looking at other people's figures, but when you sit down and you look at your own figures and how you incorporate it into your own system and you start putting the ducks in a row, it really starts hammering home what this thing can give you. And Don, like I said, there's there's various different co-ops doing things. Like, you know, it started off, there were incentives to milk record. And now, I guess, in more recent times, it is something that... I suppose the indication is it's going to be compulsory across co-ops. Do you see that every co-op in the country at some point is going to reach that um, that stage of it's compulsory and if you don't milk record, your milk won't be collected? Or will it not be as extreme as that? I, I suppose when you look at it, from the point of view of the, redu- the 50% reduction in antimicrobial use that's stipulated from through the EU, you know, through the cap organizations and stuff, that cannot be achieved without milk recording unless you have individual data on a cow. So the pressure that's coming on the veterinary pr- practitioners and through the co-ops to deliver on, and in society in general, on reducing the use of antimicrobials significantly and quickly, you cannot do it without milk recording. You can't, you just, you can't square that circle without it. So to be fair to the co-ops, there's a number of them after steady up to the market and offering financial incentives to farmers to help reimburse that, to be honest, it shouldn't be needed anyway, because it's so, it's so valuable to your business anyway. You shouldn't need an incentive to do it, but they are putting incentives there, and farmers should be availing of that, and significant incentives to, to get you up and going. You know, so it, it is, I, I think, look, it will be, uh, if it's not compulsory, it's going to be very close to it, it for a start, because it, you know, no matter what way you look at it, how, how, do you, how do you square the circle? You can't, can't make it work in your way. I, I, I can't see it working in any other way. Yeah. And finally, to wrap up and I suppose condense what we have discussed today, Don, for farmers who are in the situation where they have elevated cell count or they've, you know, several cases of mastitis over the first couple of weeks of the lactation, can you give us your tips to tackle the problem? Okay. Um, so right at the moment, no one said we, I would, and I know we go on about going together, but definitely you take advantage of the weather at the moment. We're dealing just now at the moment. You get out, you reduce the challenge in the shed, you reduce the environmental, load, you give yourself a break, and you give the sheds a break and get to go. Try uh, uh, farm specific now. The certain farms will need more time, but you try and prioritize getting out. The second thing is any clinical cases of mastitis, you have to take samples to know your enemy. Second thing is whatever you have, 
you mitigate any spread. At least I'm getting a couple of cases. Stop it at those. Stop it spreading. I apply the tea tip properly, 15 mils per cup. Wearing my gloves, I disinfect the clusters. I get a couple of bags of that disinfectant line. I use it on the cube pools. You know, I just bed the whole thing down, watch the calving pins. And if there is some heifers left, which they all will be, and I had issues with my in-calf heifers calving on massa, I would teed spread those in-calf heifers, anything that's calving from now on, to help stop them from getting any mastitis from now on. And the last point, sorry, you know, is, is I would go to treatment. If there is treatments, hit them hard and follow the full course. I, I think there's some really, really good points there, Don. And as you say, there's a lot of herds now in the next couple of weeks are going to be hitting that 60 days post calving. And, you know, from what we've discussed today and just bro- broader conversations that are, you know, being had within the industry and what we've discussed in the past, milk recording is fundamental to keeping the um cell count low and keeping the herd healthy from an other perspective so you know really important that farmers keep that in mind and get the milk recording booked in with um you know their their supplier thank you don thank you Melise. that's it for this week's episode of the dairy edge podcast and my thanks to don crowley for joining me on this week's show don't forget to rate review and subscribe to the podcast You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.